I think we are ready for the next topic. And it's tunneling. Uh, with two N's and one L, right? Two N, one L, right? Tunneling. So, <clears throat> let me start by telling you, by showing you a classically bound system. Okay, here's a system that is classically bound. It's a car that has, this is potential energy, okay? This is V of X. But potential energy is also, uh, like if you have like a landscape like this, it also corresponds to potential energy of the system, right? And you have a car here, and the car has this much kinetic plus potential energy. So the energy, so kinetic energy is zero when the car reaches here, and the car is inside, that's the whole point. So the car is here, when it is here, it has that much potential energy, hence its kinetic energy is zero. If it's over here, it's moving to, towards left or right, depending on what was happening. And when it comes back here, it stops again, because that's all the energy it has. So this car cannot go over this place or over this place, right? So it's a classically bound system. Do you understand this? Yes? Well. Uh, the same system would be, the same system is a scattering state in a quantum mechanical, so it's not bound quantum mechanically. Okay, what do I mean by that? Let's just... Uh, copy this. Let's say you have a wave function. You start a wave function and you can localize this wave function. You can localize it like so. So let me actually localize it completely. So it's zero and then over here some wiggles, zero everywhere else. Okay? What happens is that if you start this wave, sh wave function up, it will spread and it will actually be able to spread outside this potential, okay? This potential is not infinite, right? Not infinite, not infinite over here. So by, by time, it will spread out and it will be something like this. Okay, there, although at the beginning there was no possibility of the particle to be outside of this uh, well, okay, well on the hill, right? It's a well on the hill. You go up the hill and then there's a well. Uh, there's a nice word for it. Uh, vadi, what is? Valley, yes, it's a valley, right? Two, between two hills. So classical particle cannot go over the hill because it doesn't have enough energy. So if, if you have energy of this much for a classical system, it's not classically bound either, right? If you have that much energy, then it means that you can actually <coughs> can go over these uh, hills, right? You have enough speed to not stop before going to the hill. All right? So, uh, something really, really weird and something that has 
no classical analog is happening here and we are calling it tunneling. So how do we treat this system? How do we understand these systems? There is a very simple potential that we analyze in this case. Uh, what should we call it? A potential barrier. Let me just call it potential barrier. Right? All right. So what kind of a potential do we have? <clears throat> Let's say this is x, OK? And I have a potential here that is 0 over here. Then it goes up to a certain value. Then it goes down again. OK? This is x. This is 0. This is a, this is minus a. So this is my potential. And I'm trying to figure out what is the probability of a particle if I shoot a particle from here. Let's say I shoot a particle from here. What is the probability of this one passing to the other side? That's my main concern here. Okay. OK, we are going to use some stuff from the previous lecture. For example, in the previous lecture, if you remember, we said that e to the i k x corresponds to a particle moving right, <coughs> right, with momentum h bar times k. Do you remember this? Yes? But then we realized that, that this kind of a particle cannot exist. Do you remember that? Because we couldn't normalize it. Yes or no? What was our solution to that problem? Incidentally, we made a huge mistakes there. <laughs> Let me fix them. For example, here. Do you see uh, there's an integral here over x? It should be over k. Okay, because if you make an if you take an integral over x, you no longer have a function of x. Sorry about that. Okay, then do you see we have carried that here, and then here for some reason I have delta x. You know, no one is correcting me, so I just go ahead with this. So, now correct it. And now that we are here, let me talk about this stuff. So we decided that although you cannot have this one by itself, you can actually construct a normalizable wave function by using summation over this kind of a wave and the waves nearby, right? So we were building up the wave. So we would choose a momentum and use momenta similar to that. Do you remember this? Do you remember all this? Yes? So the sharper it is in the momentum space, the wider it is in the x space, and vice versa. Now. In while we are doing this potential barrier problem, we will actually go against that one more time. Okay. We are going to say that, okay, we are aware that you need to deal with the wave packages, right? But let's say we are not interested in normalization. We are just interested in the outcome of this scattering problem. OK, so we are interested in the following. So we are changing a little bit our assumptions. We are saying that if I have e a times e to the i k x, then I sort of have a particle that has this much amplitude going to the right. Uh, this this, okay. 
this much of the particle going to the right with momentum h bar k okay while if I'm writing like this b times e to the i k x let me put minus then this represents this much of particle going to the left with p equals to minus h bar k do you buy this you don't buy this why you buy this you are okay with it are you all okay with it okay then then um, I'm going to actually divide this system into three regions so there will be a region one where I will have psi of one there will be a region two where I will have psi of two and there will be a region three psi of three okay sorry psi of three so I'm, I'm writing one wave function actually but I'm writing it in three pieces all right what I want to achieve what I'm curious about is this if I send e to the i k x e to the i k x how much of it will reflect okay I'm sending e to the i k x and this much of like it's one it's, there's one here hidden one here right one squared of par particle sent in r squared of particle comes back right sent in this much is reflected right and this is the barrier in between and then on the other side i have t times e to the i k x which is t squared is transmitted so let me write it down here so that we have space so this much is transmitted so I'm using the this is the barrier part I'm using the semi-infinite nature of this problem semi-infinite towards left semi-infinite towards right from left I'm sending it I only care about what what is reflected on the right it goes on forever to the right so I'm not expecting any reflection from there right I only expect the trans transmission all right good one thing that I have to tell you is this okay let, let me start by Uh, I didn't write it properly right thank you very much please keep correcting me this is right do, do you all understand why this is the case very good very good so as do you notice something about this picture let me copy this while drawing this I have already presumed some shape here so I presumed that it will be sinusoidal here it's like a sine like wave here sine like wave here but a decaying wave here I, I, I can presume that because my energy is somewhere here okay so since my energy is here over here 
energy, my energy is above the potential. And over here, my energy is above the potential. Okay? And wherever energy is above the potential, we expect wiggly wave function. Okay? Wherever energy is less than the potential, okay, that's the non-classical part. Okay? Classically, a particle cannot be there. All right? Classically, it's impossible for them because it's like uh, you have a mountain and you go <laughs> to the mountain with your car, you just can't pass, right? Unless you have a tunnel, but you don't have a tunnel, okay? Yes? Good? So this is basically, you have oscillating solutions here, decaying solutions here. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, what, what does imaginary momentum mean? Exactly. But it has no classical analog of momentum being imaginary, right? Okay. So we only understand it really mathematically. At least I do understand it mathematically. All right. So let me write it down. So for the first region, I have a solution in the form e to the i k x plus r times e to the minus i k x. What is this k here? The k here is related to my energy. Energy is h bar squared k squared over 2m. Right? So this k here is basically square root of 2me over h bar squared. So far, so good? Let me remind you where this comes from. This one comes from an equation that looks like this. h bar squared over 2m d squared phi 1 over dx squared. equals to E phi 1. Did I make a mistake here? No mistake, right? Are you following? Yes? So this is the first region. Let me put a line here. On the second region, on the second region, h bar squared over 2m d squared phi 2 over dx squared is actually, uh, let me think about it. Is it e plus v zero? Oh, sorry, okay, sorry, sorry. Yes, we have v zero here, phi two equals e time phi 2. Do you have any objection to this? Why we don't have v in the first equation? v, yes. Because it's 0, OK? In the first region, it's 0. In the second region, it's v0. And n remember, in that region, actually v is higher than E. So what you have here is E minus V0 times phi 2. Notice that this part is positive, okay? Hence, from that positiveness, you get wiggles, okay? You get e to the i k x and e to the minus i k x, okay? And both of them are wiggly. But this part is negative, so then you get e to the 
plus kx. It's a different k. There's no i here. And e to the minus kx. So you have decaying and growing solutions. No oscillations. Did you follow this part? Am I going too slow? Too fast? Huh? It's, a, it's fine, right? Too fast, maybe? No. Boom. All right. So I can write down phi 2. Uh, by the way, I am sometimes using phi, sometimes using psi. Sorry about that. Hmm? Uh, for this particular case, just assume they are the same thing, okay? Phi 2 will be some coefficient a e to the kx plus b e to the minus kx, where k is 2m times v0 minus e over h bar squared square root. Can you compare this k and the big k? Do you see the difference? This one is positive, but here v0 minus e is positive. Okay, in one case it's e itself is positive, in the other case v0 minus e is positive. Okay, do you have any questions at this point? No? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to solve the whole system and figure out what R is and what T is. Okay, that's what we are after here. The last region, phi 3, is also oscillating, right? And it's a bit easier because the last region only has outgoing part. I don't have last region in my notes for some reason, but we already written it, right? It's t times e to the i k x, where k is the same 2 m e over h bar squared. So, how can we find r and t? There are only two things that are missing from here. And we are assuming that we are, we are assuming that E is a given. E is a given. So we are not looking after it. We are looking after R and T. How many equations do we need? Two equations. Where are we going to get them? From the boundary conditions. Very good. Let's do it. Shouldn't we need more? Where are the four variables? Can you please remind me? Ah, yes, yes. We also don't have, we also don't know A, B. So we need four boundary conditions, right? We have four boundary conditions. And let me tell you what they are. Let me draw this one one more time. So I'm going to take this, copy this, and draw this one more time. OK. So what are these boundaries? Over here, phi 1 at x equals to minus a needs to be equal to phi 2 at x equals to minus a. Do you agree with this? Yes? Phi 1, I mean d phi 1 over dx, the derivative at x equals to minus a needs to be equal to the derivative of the other function at x equals to x minus a. So far so good? 
And you can guess the other two. Phi 2 at x equals to a is phi 3 at x equals to a. And finally, d phi 2 over dx, x equals to a, equals d phi 3 over dx at equals x equals to a. Four boundary conditions, and we are looking for um, a, b, r, t. Four variables, four equations. After a lot of mathematics, a lot of maths. No, not at all. Okay, if you are interested, you can go ahead and read it from classical books. But the point is that transmission square, I mean, probability of transmission is 2k bk squared over, very complicated, right? k squared plus k squared squared sine hyperbolic, I don't know if you remember them or not, sine hyperbolic squared 2ka plus 2kk squared. Seems like if we give some names, it would be easier to write. This is what comes out. Okay? Actually, what is much more important, so I will actually reduce this to not being a boxed equation, but instead I'm going to box the following equation. T squared is approximately, oh, not approximately, it's proportional to minus 2Ka. That's the most important part. Okay, so how, how does this one lead to that one? Can you see how this is that? Sine hyperbolic, everybody seems to know it. Very good. Uh, although now I'm thinking about why we don't have e to the minus 4ka. Maybe it's 4ka and it's, can you check it please? Because, uh, so the, the thing that I'm worried about is that, so what we have hidden here is e to the 2ka minus. minus e to the minus 2ka over two, and then we square it, right? So isn't it supposed to be e to the 4ka? Are you checking it, Akin? 4ka uh, over k squared over 2 squared. OK. Uh, Akin is checking it. We will come back to this. The point is, the point is that transmission, probability of transmission is proportional to e to the minus 2a and then you have 2m v0 minus e over h bar squared. Okay, I, I've just opened the above equation up. I've just put whatever k is inside. So this k is that k. It's 2 and it's still t squared, right? Okay, then we can figure it out during the break or something. The most important thing is to understand what this formula tells us. It tells us that if you have a barrier, if you have a barrier that, that has a width of 2a,
Okay. Okay. Could be. Could be. Could be. So I will check. I will check it. But the point is that let me actually reduce it to um, let me just make it D. Okay. And this is and let me let's have some energy E and this is V0 this difference is V0 minus E okay how higher is the barrier with respect to your energy okay basically what is the hill that you are supposed to go over okay and it tells us that transmission transmission probability is proportional to e to the minus d and e to the okay let's put also square root here somehow square root of v0 minus e what that, so what does it tell you if you increase the width of the barrier there's an exponential decrease in probability of going to the other side first of all first of all we have to talk about probability of going to the other side not being zero okay that's very very weird it's like a car comes to a, a mountain and there is no tunnel okay car comes to the mountain disappears here and reappears on the other side and continues its I mean continues going all right that's how more or less this is um, we sometimes joke between us that especially toddlers small kids have this property whenever something really dangerous is happening you can leave them here not look at at them because you are not making measurement right and the next time you look at it they have tunneled to the most dangerous place okay it's something like that and by the way since we started talking about time tunneling time is a discussion some physicists would say that tunneling time is uh, zero okay so it takes no time for the particle to tunnel okay and some physicists would say that no uh, we can calculate that time and that time actually is relevant to bi some biological processes to learn more uh, you can attend uh, uh, when is it 6 330 in physics department there is this very well established professor who is vis visiting us from Sabanja from Sabanja University and he's going to talk about his work where he calculates tunneling and it's biologically relevant okay for some DNA repair stuff so you can ask him uh, your questions Hojam, why do you think this is the case and not the other way around? Okay. Both sides are quite serious physicists, so you should listen both. Okay. I have ten more minutes to. Okay, yes, and the presentation is related to that also. So are we now on the side where it's not instant? Not instant. Okay. Like I haven't thought about it like that much. So. Like assume a time space that it, it couldn't, because the information is traveling, right? So it can only travel at the speed of light, so 
All right. Uh, I don't know about that. So, I mean, very serious physicists would claim that uh, you don't have that C problem here. It actually tunnels <laughs> with infinite speed. I don't know. Okay. What I do know is it was part of the nanoscience, nanotechnology revolution because it all starts with STM scanning, tunneling, microscope, right? So the idea here is this. Uh, is it Gerd Binnick? Yes, Gerd Binnick. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to write his name correctly. Can you check it? Yes, there's also Heinrich Rohrer. Is he already? Because the other person is Heinrich Rohrer, who actually visited UNAM. Uh, uh, unfortunately, he is not living anymore, but uh, you can look for his name as well. Okay. IBM, right? So, these people were thinking in IBM and <laughs> uh, I think this idea is Gerd's idea, right? Because it appears in his notebook. So, he thinks about a tip. This is a tip and it's a thousand angstrom wide, okay? He realized that if we have conductive materials on both sides, all right. So how how electrons would see this part? This part it's like a metal, and for electrons, I'm right now drawing potential like this. So it's like x direction or y direction, and. Uh, This is V of Y. Does it make sense? Yes or no? So it, there's a well here for the electrons, then there's a barrier, and there's a well there for electrons again. Because metals are like wells for electrons. They, they like to live there, right? And then you need to have work function to rip them off. Do you remember that? Yes? So this portion is the barrier for the electrons. Now electrons are sitting here happily, also electrons sitting here happily. But this barrier in the middle acts as a barrier. They can tunnel, right? They're tunneling is proportional to e to the minus d, so this distance d, e to the minus d, and the potential of the barrier. Let's focus on d. Let's focus on the distance. Since it's going with e to the minus d, <coughs> there will be much more current when it's close by, right? And it will suddenly drop to zero when it grows larger. Do you understand what just happened? So the tunneling current is sharply decreasing as you go away from the point of contact, right? So what happens is that this 1000 angstrom tip, it acts as if it is a 40 nanometer tip, sorry, 40 angstrom tip. That's according to Binnick's calculations. Does it make sense or not? So there's a tip. This part is really close. Let me show it like this. There's a tip. This part is really close. It has some current. And the moment you go away from it, it sharply decreases. So instead of having 
a hand looking for what's going on, there's a finger coming out. Do you understand this? Yes? STM? We don't have STM in UNAM. Sorry. But we do have TEM if it still works. Does it still work? <laughs> okay. Okay, it's a quantum system. It sometimes works, sometimes Can you doesn't. Want to use it? No. Ah, I see. When you want to use it, you are doing a measurement. Buradan yetkililere sesleniyoruz. Unam needs STM. It, can it handle STM? Like. Yes. Th there is AFM. Two AFM. AFM is like this, right? Like a like a box. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So here we need to be careful about what we see in STM. Okay. What we see in STM, okay, I will talk about STM later on, maybe. Uh, let's stop here. Uh, let's have a break here.